Jesus. Okay, brother Eli, you might have a little offering. Drink them down good. Well, good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Really, there's no other place that I'd rather be. It's raining on the inside, but this outside, but this is where the Holy Ghost rains on us on the inside. Well, it could rain blessings inside. Exactly. <laughs> Holy Ghost is the one that delivers them. But we've been looking at what major topic, what has been the broad study of our Sunday school. Yes. Well, back up. Sir, sorry, Sister Todd, you came in in the middle of it all. We've been doing this for a while. But uh, we've been looking at the church. And what is the church? Because really, we are living in a day and age of, we need to know what is the church? What is the purpose of the church? If we go back to the time of Abraham, we find that God was looking for a people that were in the world, but they were not of this world, to quote John chapter 17. And as we look throughout the word of God, that's exactly what God is looking for. A people that are separated unto him, they may be in this world, but they are not of this world. They are not the church that is trying to get people in through movies, through dance, secular dances, trying to do the things of the world, trying to get the, work, get the kids in the church. That's not the way it's meant to be. We cannot entice the world with worldly things, but rather it's the spirit of God that drew, draws men, and it's the spirit of God that is the sign of the true church, as we find out a little bit here coming up in today's lesson. But we're looking at the church. God's looking for a called out people. People that are nothing like the world. They are separated unto him. They are concentrated unto him. And God's given them laws and direction on how they should live. We, in order to do so, we cannot do that in our, of our own being. Because we can take that example from the children of Israel back in the wilderness. They tried to follow the commandments of God. Some of them with their whole heart. But they were trying to do a spiritual thing through the flesh. The Ten Commandments, lying, stealing, other of the commandments that God gave them. Why couldn't they fulfill these things perfectly into a T? Because they were doing it in of their own flesh. You cannot fulfill a spiritual means through fleshly means. So, that is where the Holy Ghost comes in. That is how we fulfill the commandments of God today. If we try to do them on our own, we're going to fail every single time because we cannot obey the commandments of God on our own. We cannot try to do it through our own flesh, but rather it's the Holy Ghost working through us that is helping us and enabling us to live a victorious Christian life. We cannot do that on our own without the help of God. That is how we fulfill a spiritual thing in this current flesh. It's not through the flesh that we do it, but we do it through the flesh, through the Spirit of God. And in order to do so, God's given us gifts. We talk about those. Pastors, evangelists, prophets, teachers, diversity of tongues, helps, governments. But not only has God given us those gifts to help us grow spiritually, to help us reach the lost, because when it comes to the church, it's not these four walls. This is not the church. We are the church. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. The prophets and the apostles form the foundations. And then we are the lively blocks that keep building onto the church of God, or the kingdom of heaven, depending on how you want to phrase it. But God has given us gifts. We've already talked about those. Apostles, prophets, preachers, teachers. But God has done something farther and beyond that. God's given us gifts in our own life. Not just people to guide us, because we all need that. Sorry. I said, well, you know, I'm excited. He gave us gifts. Woo! -hoo! From the back row. If the back row can get into it, we know we all can then. <laughs> but he's not only given us gifts to guide us, direct us, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the saints, for the education of the saints. But he's also given each one of us gifts. And we talked about that last week as well. Some of us are creative. Some of us have the gift of hospitality. 
Some of us have the gift of giving. Some of us just have the gift of gab. That's all there is to it. But God has given each one of us gifts. And when we look at it, our Heavenly Father is the author of all creativity. And He expects us to go farther with our gift than just merely what He's given us. And sometimes we realize what they are at an early age. Some people are good at drawing. Some people are good at talking. Etc. Et and we find out what these gifts are. And sometimes we really, really like these gifts. And because of that, we pursue after that and we go farther and farther and farther. Well, God's given all of us different gifts for a reason. Not everyone's a head, not everyone's a hand, not everybody's a foot. But rather, all of these come together and work as one body. So when we all come together with our different gifts, they are for the furthering of the kingdom of God. And God never meant for us to come to church and sit on a pew and that was it. But rather, he expects us to grow the kingdom. He expects us to go out and tell others about Christ, dying on the cross, and how they need him for if they're going to even make it into heaven. He expects us to expand the kingdom. And he expects us to use our gifts. If we go back to the parable of the talent, do you remember the parable of the talent? I don't remember it in detail because I'm going off the cuff right now. But he gave one, I think, five, one, two, one, one, or five, three, and one, something like that. But what do they do with their talents? Two of those talent uh, gentlemen took their talents and they went out and expanded them. They got more talents. What do we do with our gifts that God has given to us? We are to expand them or to make them grow. If it's something we really enjoy, we're not in the exact same location as we were when we first realized we had this gift. But rather, we've grown with it. We've expanded it. We've pushed beyond the limits. In fact, if we really, really enjoy the gift that God's given us, if it's a hobby or something like that, drawing, woodworking, whatever it is, we grow in that hobby and we push out of limits. I, I wonder if I can do that. Or somebody else mentioned something earlier. You're like, can you do this? No, I never thought of that. And if we don't know how to, guess what we do? We find out that. We find somebody that does know how to do that and say, hey, how can I do this? Well, we open up a book, or the day and age we're living in, we open up Google and YouTube, but we take that gift and we push it farther. And if we really enjoy it, we'll push it to the extremes of, I wonder what I can do with it. And that's how we become an expert in our gift. But, how are we using that gift for the kingdom of God? Yes, we may enjoy it, but God's given us our gifts for a reason. And are we using them to glorify God? We asked the famous, we quoted the famous phrase last week from JFK, which was, Ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. And then I flipped it around. Ask not what your church can do for you, but ask what can you do for the church. Now today we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. If someone would please read that. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. And this morning I don't have any notes. I was running late and I... <gasps> and I couldn't get the copier to work, but I think I plugged in the monitor to the computer and not the copier. So that would have been spite of that, I think. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. That's fine. She's right in front of me. But First Peter chapter four, eight through ten. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man has received a gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold things of God. So we have two gifts listed right here. Fervent charity and hospitality. And if we get to verse 10, as every man hath received what? The gift. So not everyone has the gift of drawing. Not everyone is artistic. Some people have book smarts, some people have common sense. <clears throat> and then you have the flip side, where some people don't have book smarts, some people don't have common sense. But everybody has something. It's a matter of digging deep in and finding out. 
But today we're going to be looking at charity and hospitality. So when we look at the word for charity, the word charity occurs in 25 verses of the New Testament. However, if you look at the Greek word that's used for charity in 1 Peter chapter 4, it comes from the Greek word agape. And for anyone who's been in church long enough and heard the pastor preach on it, agape is one of the strongest word, uh, Greek words that's used for love. It's dear. It's precious. It's something that no one, you don't want anybody to take from you. It's a feeling that you have for someone or something that you just couldn't really think of any words to really describe, but you know that if you lost it or you lost them, you'd be lost. There's no way to describe it. They just mean that much to you. And we find that in Greeks, in Strong's Greek Dictionary, that it means love, affection, benevolence, especially a love. And then it gets into the Feast of Charity. Or dear love. Like I said, it's a love that is precious. Something or someone that is so close to you, you just can't imagine life without it or them. But the Greek word agape occurs in 106 <coughs> verses of the New Testament, and it has been translated love, the love, charity, charitable, after charity, of love, <coughs> dear. Now, when we get on to put on charity, can anybody tell me, if you see a child-sized words in the KJV, what does that mean? This is a little bit of a side note. The translators of the King James Version of the Bible were so particular, not only did they have a bunch of different committees reviewing each section of the Bible and each book, and went through painstaking tasks, but when they translated it, if there was a uh, Greek word or Hebrew word that wasn't completely trans I wouldn't say translatable, but in the English, to give better clarity, they were add a few words, and to let us know that they added those words to give better clarity that phrase or verse, they put them in the italicized, which are those slanted letters. So that's why those letters, those words are italicized, put on. And then finally we get to charity. So when we look at this type of love, as we've already said, it's a specific love. It's a love between a mother and a son, a mother and a daughter. Someone that is extremely, extremely close. You cannot get any closer. This is the type of love that we are referring to. Not a general love, like I love my pen, or I love my car, but it's something specific. It's precious. You just can't imagine going on without it. Which I realize that some people lost their car, and they just can't imagine going on life without that either. But it's a love that's not your ordinary love. We can go down to somebody that we may meet. No, a co-worker, a uh, friend, oh, I love you, but shake hands, yada, yada, yada. But there's always that one person that you're just closest to. You just, if something happened, your whole world would be turned upside down, chaotic, and for some people, they have trouble moving on. This is the type of love that we are talking about. So how do we cultivate or develop a love like that within ourselves? How do you guys think that we develop a love like this within ourselves? What are some of the steps that we would take? Well, the first one, and the first biggie, would be accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Because when we look at the kingdom of light versus the kingdom of darkness, and when I say that, I mean God's kingdom versus the devil's kingdom, how's the devil's kingdom held in check? Why doesn't one demon try to overtake another demon and so forth and so forth? For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. The devil's kingdom is run through fear. When the devil comes against you, does he try to give you a loving sensation? Is it just a love that overwhelms everything? No. What does he bring against us? Fear. How does he try to take us down? Through fear. Yeah, well, torment goes right along with fear. If you don't have fear, you're, you can't really be tormented. But he plays on those things. And so, if the devil's kingdom is held together through fear, what is God's kingdom held together with? 
God's kingdom is held together with love. Which means we cannot live like the world and do all those evil things and expect to cultivate this type of love. We really can't. But when we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, that is the turning point. That's when everything begins to change. That's when we start maybe experience, for some people, that's the first time they really start experiencing love for the first time in their life. The fact that God loves them so much that he sent his only son to die on a cross for them, man, that's life-changing. If we're going to go a little bit farther, what comes along with accepting Jesus Christ as a personal Savior? Can we just go back out and live whatever way we wanted to before? No. God has stipulated. God has guidelines. What does 1 John chapter 2, verse 5 read? First John 2, 5. So whoso keepeth what? His word. And what happens when we keep his word? We are perfected. Perfected in what? The love of we are perfected in the love of God. So how do we cultivate a love that goes beyond any recognition, beyond anything that this world could even possibly understand? We accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, but that's not the end of it. We have to obey the commandments of God. We have to listen to to the word of God. When God says don't do something in the Bible and we realize it, we need to not do it. Because that's how we cultivate and perfect the love of God in our life. When the word of God says that we should be doing something that we don't, we need to start doing that one thing. Because the thing is, those are the commandments that God's given us. And he's told us that if we obey his word, that's when the love of God is perfected within us. If someone would please read 1 John 5, 3. First John five three. This is the love of God that you keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. So this is <coughs> what? The love of God. The love of God. That you keep what? Commandments. His commandments. So we come back to that if we want the love of God perfected in our life. This love that transcends anything this world can possibly understand, we have to obey the commandments of God. It is not once saved, always saved. But if we really want to experience the love of God in our life, that we can show it to others, it's going to begin not just after we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, but when we start obeying His Word. And then finally, in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and 20, and I'll read that. Deuteronomy 30, 20. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, to give him. So we have to love the Lord thy God, and obey his voice, obey his commandments, obey what he's given to us, obey what he's told us, whether it's verbal. Sometimes God will tell us, you know what, you may not, you don't, Sister God, don't you dare do that. But he hasn't told Brother Eli not to do that. Sometimes God does give us personal convictions, and they are for us. But other times, there are things that are clear in God's word that he said, don't steal, don't lie, don't do this. Well, then definitely black and white. That's for everybody. But we need to obey the voice of God, obey his commands. If we want to cultivate the love of God in our life, we must obey what God instructs us throughout our life. The next one is, if someone would please find Mark chapter 12 and 30. Mark 12, 30. Thank you. 
God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. So it's not just a matter of obeying the commandments. It's not just a matter of asking Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. But we need to love God with everything that is within us. Which means, if we arrange it and rephrase it, we need to try to get as close to God as possible. When we pray, when we read the Word of God, it's in the words of the Apostle Paul that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. So when we do these things, it's not just a matter of just doing it because we are instructed to, but we'll get to a point where we do them because we say, I love my Master. I love my Lord. I love my Savior. And you know what? I'm going to do everything I can within my power to get close to Him, that I may know Him. It may involve us giving up things that God never told us to give up. But we give them up because we know that God has something better for us. Or we give something up because it's taking away some personal time that we could be spending with God in prayer, getting to know Him, getting to know Him through His Word, communing with Him. And it's just, not just a matter of communion and getting to know God, but it's a matter of getting to know um, the Holy Ghost as well, how He works in our lives, how He feels, to get a sense of uh, His voice throughout our life. And what happens with the closer we get to God? Something begins to happen. Do we stay the same way we were before? No, we don't. But God changes us. When we look at this Christian walk, it's not a matter of uh, the Christian religion. It's not a religion at all. It's classified as a religion. Don't call it Christianity, but for anyone who's really in it, we know it's not really a religion. It's a relationship. It's our relationship with God. And as we conduct that relationship, as we pursue that relationship, we're going to want to get to know who God is. Just like we would anybody else we have a relationship with. Friend, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife. We pursue at some point to get to know them better. We ask them questions, we spend time with them, but we need to do the same thing with God. And as that happens, we slowly get transformed. Our mind starts getting transformed. Be ye, renewed, uh, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. We start having the desire that David had after his sin with Bathsheba. I can't remember the exact psalm, but create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Those major organs just change. I don't want them anymore. God, my heart is deceitfully wicked. Only you can know. Reveal it to me that I may change. It is a changing process. And who are we being transformed into? The image of Jesus Christ. And when we look at Jesus Christ, he's a reflection of the Father. And what does 1 John 4, 7 and 8 reveal to us about God? 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Big old book 
full of gold stars for every time he showed up at church, and that Sunday school attendance is going to override all those bad things. No, that's not the way it works. God is love. We need to allow God to change us into his image. If we are going to experience the love of God flowing through us, it is going to come when we have a relationship with God and we allow him to change us. And it is the Holy Ghost who is the one who places this love within each one of us. In Romans 5.5, 5, if you want to document that, that's fine. I'll read it, but Romans 5.5. 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So it's the Holy Ghost that places that love within each one of us. But does anyone have 1 John 4.16? 1 John 4.16. So he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. If you really want to experience this love that surpasses all understanding, it's going to first come when we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Second, when we obey the commandments of God. Thirdly, when we build on that relationship with God and do our best to draw as close to him as possible. And when we do that, God will slowly begin changing us. Sometimes it'll be fast, most times it's slow. It'll happen over a period of time. And it's the Holy Ghost who's the one that places that love within us because God is love. And if we do not reflect this love, then we are not God's. But when we have this love within us because we've been building on that relationship with God, the Bible says that by your fruits ye shall know them. Now that's not just talking about this verse here, but it's talking about their actions, their words, where they go, what they say. But we can also apply to this verse the fact that if you don't have love, you don't know God. Or you need to work on your relationship with God because there's something lacking there. And when it gets down to it, this is an area we all can improve on. Just because I do believe that we can have that Enoch experience where God said one day that you know what, you're closer to my place. Why don't you come on home? And we all need to love people more. We all need to show them the love of God. Because the Bible says that we in our epistles rid red of men. And finally, in the last couple minutes, we'll move on to hospitality. Um, the word hospitality occurs in four verses of the New Testament. We're not going to read those for the sake of time. We, um, it comes from the Greek word phylos, uh, phylosemus. It means fond of guests, hospitable, given to hospitality, or somebody who loves to be hospitable. In the Greek, it only occurs in three verses of the New Testament, and it was translated to given to hospitality, a lover of hospitality, and use of hospitality. When we look at 1 Timothy and Titus, those two passages um, deal with the office of a deacon. But when we look at 1 Peter chapter 4, as we've already read, that's a passage that refers to absolutely every single one of us. And really, if we have charity, if we have love, then the second one should just fall right into place. Because if we love people, we want to see them succeed. We want them to know Christ. We want them to have a relationship with God, not just like we have. But our desire for everyone should be that they go farther than we are. No matter of pushing them, that they go, that they are a better Christian than we are. That they are more knowledgeable in the Bible. How can I help you in your walk with Christ? How can I help you get closer to God? Where, how can I direct you? How can I help you encourage you? But when we have the love of God, hospitality comes along with it. And we are to be given to hospitality, or we are to be hospitable. And why are did we? Why should we be hospitable? Because we never know who we're entertaining. What does Hebrews chapter thirteen and verse twelve state? Hebrews twelve and thirteen. Hebrews thirteen twelve. 
Hebrews 13, 12. Hebrews 13, 12. That's Hebrews 13, 12. Okay, then I got the wrong passage. But there's a passage somewhere in the Bible, probably in the book of Hebrews, that states that we entertain angels unaware. You know, we never know who we're dealing with on an everyday basis. It could be somebody, I work retail, we all know that. I never know who I'm dealing with. For all I know, I've entertained angels that came into the um, oil change aisle lane or something rather like We don't know. How do we respond to strangers? How do we deal with somebody we don't know? Is it possible that you help somebody in your life and you just didn't realize that maybe it was an angel unaware? We never know who we're entertaining. But... Matthew chapter 25, 34 through 40 does state this. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore if he shall say unto you, if they say unto you, behold, he is at the... Uh, that would be 24, I need 25. Okay. Matthew 25, 34 through 40. For I was hung up. Uh, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee an hunger and fed thee? or thirst, and give thee drink. When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Insomuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So not only do we entertain angels unaware, but if we do something out of the goodness of our heart, if we do it with a pure heart, if we do it as unto God, He recognizes it. Because as much as ye have done unto the least, ye have done it unto me. But what is our heart mentality? What is our attitude sometimes when we're dealing with people? You know, we need to cultivate the love of God within our heart. And I'm not talking the love gospel that they're preaching out there nowadays. I'm talking about the real love of God. To know the love of God. Because hospitality comes along with that and it is also one of the gifts. And we never know who we're being hospitable towards. But one thing we do know is on an everyday basis, there's always somebody watching our actions. Someone watching how we respond. For years and years and years, I had an employee at, under me at Walmart, and he always kept telling me, he goes, Justin, I'm watching. He said, one of these days, they're going to push you too far. He goes, and I'm going to be there when you flip out on them. You know, that's never happened. But for his three years being that he was under me, he watched and he watched and he watched. It never happened. We never know who's watching. But one thing we are sure of, that somebody is always watching. If we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2, the Bible states that we are epistles read and act. People watch us every day to see how we respond. Do we respond with a Christ-like attitude? Do we respond with the love of Christ? We never know who we are affecting. There's the old illustration of the gentleman who's along, going along the seashore. And he picks up a starfish and he tosses it into the sea. And he goes and he picks up another one and he tosses it into the sea. And then comes someone else and asks him what he's doing. And he claims, look at the shoreline. It is covered in starfish. You're not making a difference. And 
the gentleman goes over and picks up one starfish, tosses it in the sea, goes, I made a difference for that starfish. Picks up another one, tosses it in the sea, I made a difference for that starfish. No, we will never see the difference that we're going to make. But people are constantly watching. I, for me, the one that has stuck with me was the one day there was a woman that came into Walmart. She was in the oil change lane. And I went out, and I was in some weird mood. Because when you get into your workplace, you get into a different mindset. You get it, and then the retail area, I don't care anymore. I am loud. I can be obnoxious. I'm sarcastic, depending on how I think I can act and respond with you and interact. Well, I went out, and this woman had her name across her license plate. So I went right out and I said, hey, so-and-so, Ashley, whatever it was. And she just looked at me and she goes, do I know you? I said, no. She goes, how do you know my name? I don't know your license plate. But she was in tears practically. And here she was at a garage at where she needed tires. And she didn't have money for them. And she went to the junkyard and was going through the ordeal. And when it got down to it, all she needed was a flat tire. She just needed a plug in her tire. That's all it was. They were just trying to sell her a tire. So we got her square away, and the bill came to 10 bucks. Well, she didn't have the money. So I just pointed the bill and was done with it. Didn't say anything to her. I had somebody else bring me up as soon as it was done. And when she went to pay her bill, the girl told her, it's all right to pay for it, it's taken care of. And she broke down right then and there. And she goes, I bet it was so, that nice old man in the shop. My supervisor told her who it was, but even though I told her not to, she told her anyhow. But you realize, a year later, a year later, Brother Eli, I didn't even remember it happened. This woman comes in and hands me a $10 bill. She said, this is what I owe you. You don't owe me anything, what are you talking about? And then she told me the thing had started to click, and, and she insisted I took the money. How many people in the day and age we know that, that we live in does anything like that? They want your money and that's about it. I'll pay you next weekend. We'll never see that money. The ones that really need it, they aren't the ones that are going to be obvious. But literally a year later, she came back. We don't know whose lives we're influencing. We don't know how our actions, other people are perceiving them, or who's even watching them. But we need to cultivate the love of God in our life. The love that reaches out to people that says, hey, you know that Jesus died for you? And when we cultivate that love and allow God to change us, hospitality will come along with it because we want to reach out and help people any way we can. It doesn't mean that we're doormats. It means we look for that opportunity that, hey, that so-and-so really needs help right now. Let me help them. And that's what we're talking about today. So some people may say, I don't have any gifts. God's not blessed me with any talents. That's not true. We all have talents. In fact, there's one big one out there that God's waiting for us to cultivate through a relationship with him. And that has allowed him to instill more of his love within us. Because as we become transformed into the image of God, the image we're being transformed is, is to love. Because God is love. Yes, we're being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And I realize that there's so much more that comes into it. We can talk about the righteousness of God that we receive since salvation. We can talk about the faith of Christ that we can receive. But when it comes to the gifts, according to 1 Peter, we need a first work on that relationship with God, cultivating that love within our life. And we need to make sure that we are given to hospitality. Not that we're not, not that we become formats, but that. We are looking for those opportunities to give because we don't know who we're entertaining. I need to wrap this up. But years ago, years ago, before I was even married, I, I was either in high school or my early years of college. I was in Harrisburg. I was in the, I'm sure I came out of the bookstore or something like that, or Coles, but down in the Target Plaza just to get a setting. And somebody came up and asked me, do you have money for gas? Because I ran out of gas. Brother Eli, I knew I had no money in my wallet at that point in time. I really knew that. Or if I did, I thought it was like $2. And he asked me for a certain amount. 
And it wasn't five, it was like seven or something like that. And he came up, and it was getting to be evening time. Well, evening time, somebody's approaching you at Walmart or in a park lot in Harrisburg. You're looking around, who's gonna jump me as soon as I pull out my wallet? I got in my car, I locked my door because I knew I didn't have the amount he asked for. Opened up my wallet, guess how much was in my wallet? The exact amount he asked. You know, did I miss an opportunity? I don't know. But the point is, you never know who you were entertaining unaware. Sometimes we entertain angels unaware. But the word of God states, if you've done it unto the least, you've done it unto me. And with that, we are going to wrap up and we're going to get ready for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will continue to do. Lord, we're thankful that you're God who reigns on high, that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property, above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds would be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth. Let the Holy Ghost be moved as it so desired. Anoint the song leader and the musicians as they lead us in the songs you have us to sing, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you give them a special blessing as you praise them upon the string instruments and the bowl, of course. I pray, Lord, to let you anoint the pastor's mind and his lips as he brings forth your message today. And anoint our minds and our hearts to receive the message which you have for us today. That it would be good soil, Lord, that your word would fall on. That we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives. And we may be transformed even farther into your very image. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.